Honorable Speaker, we tell you today that Western values perpetuated by Hollywood have created untenable family systems. And for that reason, we are proud to support filial responsibility laws. And what we want to add as a further uh, extension to what was given in the info slide is that for middle class families and prosperous families, which are the 1% the, the going up, and excluding people who are on minimum wage, we think that these laws are fair. And what we view them to be is that parents receiving some kind of a support stipend, and also we view that as parents living with, the, with their children as far as that is reasonably possible. So we don't want to prescribe like if you have four bedrooms, but if it is within reason, we think that it's fair to expect that. And we're going to tell you three things in this debate. Firstly, that there exists a duty for this particular uh, uh, child to have a, a responsibility to the parent. Secondly, that this is a legitimate substitute for state support or retirement fund uh, support. And thirdly, that this deepens family support structures and why that's good for all people. Now, uh, yeah, so can you clarify when and how children in instances of abuse wouldn't have to care for their parents? Okay, we think that if there's been documented abuse, if there's been something that's understood to be abuse, that should be an exempt, uh, that should exempt you. Uh, we think this is not really the better debate question. We think that what we're evaluating today is whether or not we ought to support these laws in principle. The only reason why I've given you some kind of a framework is so that we can better crystallize what this kind of thing would look like. But obviously, it would look like different things in different states. We're happy to have this debate globally. Now, on the first point, that there exists a duty. We think that parenting is uh, an intricate uh, process where parents have to provide not only financial support, but emotional support, and in many instances have to sacrifice and forgo their personal development to make sure that children have optimized options. So what we see a lot of times is that parents will make sacrifices for children to go to colleges that they themselves could not go to. They make sacrifices to make sure that their children have opportunities, tutors, uh, music classes, piano lessons, uh, football classes, so that those children can have more access to resources than they did. We think that the sacrifice that those parents put in, whilst it is benevolent and from a place of love, does create a reciprocal duty to those particular children that they can't just opt out of because they find it inconvenient. And we think that those children, we, we, we say that most children, when they reach the age of maturity or when they find self-supporting jobs, will support their parents out of um, uh, love and, 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 and you know, good feelings. But those who, re who refuse to do so, we believe that it's perfectly legitimate to oblige them to do so because we believe that a reciprocal duty exists. We think that if somebody were to sacrifice for you to go out of their way to make sure that you had resources and options uh, that they didn't have, and they gave that to you, you have to some degree the same obligation towards them. This is a principal point, and we hope that it will have a principal rebuttal, which will give you an opportunity to try preempt right now. So we would have fewer parental sacrifices if the state, for example, provided state college education, better child support networks, and all things of the like. Doesn't that show you that principally we better to expand the state's support network rather than shift the burden on danger? Great. We, we don't think there's a problem with the state having more social work. What we say is that even in those kind of states, we believe that this duty still exists. So it's not, it's not great debating just to say, oh, but the state can do better in these particular ways that we've identified. We are hoping to hear an engagement of why, at a principal level, that duty doesn't exist even in an advanced state like Switzerland. And that's what we're hoping to hear from you, opposition. Now, I'm moving to our second point, why this is a legitimate substitute for state support. And when I talk about state support under this submission, what I mean is, in instances where there are no longer systems where the state is ready to support most people, and what I'm, to extend on this, right now, with the rise of companies such as Uber, where people are working 
as contractors and not as full-time employees, there is a loss of most of the benefits which accrued in the traditional company. Historically, what used to occur is that if you worked at Ford for 40 years, you would get a retirement. What has happened is that the retirement package has evolved in advanced democracies. So it's 401ks, it's in instances where there are companies like Uber, in instances where there are people who are self-employed or app developers or freelance journalists or writing papers for the Vox, we see that those kind of professionals no longer have the security of retirement. And in states where the, the state has um, obligations which create debt that cannot be paid, we think it's foreseeable that the future won't have the kind of benefits which used to exist in the past. And we think that creating these kind of regulations creates a safety net for particular families, and we think that safety net is a legitimate safety net to create to make sure that our elderly don't find themselves destitute and their children don't have an escape clause, an escape clause of simply saying, that's just my parent and I have no obligation. Lastly, we say to you that the American and the Western model of circular family units, which don't include grandmother and grandfather within the support structure, creates unhealthy relationships. In the first instance, you lose the collective wisdom of age, and that leads to more conflict within families. Because whenever you have elderly people who have the wisdom of time, there's less likely to be divorces in those kind of family units as compared to family units where it's just mom and dad and child. We think when you have the grandmom and the granddad, there's less of an incentive for you to, to break the relationship at the first instant of having fights or disruptions. So we think at, at, a, at that level, you deepen, deepen the family support structure. But further, what we think you do is you provide um, another balance or a moral, a moral person who can better raise your child. So grandparents also can be available to instill family values whilst those parents are away. We're proud to propose. sacrifice a lot, put in a lot of personal love and effort into seducing someone, but they just don't want to sleep with me. Do they have any kind of obligation to me just because I sacrificed a lot, I put things in and I loved them? Absolutely not. Now, this is a bit of a strange comparison, but here's what we're going to say holds. Why do we have adoption, for example, the moment after a woman gives birth as a legitimate option? And what was the watershed moment? We recognize that women can accidentally get pregnant. That does not re reconsider legitimate consent to have a child. None of us consented to be born, so I don't think it's enough to say that just because your parents loved you a lot and put in effort, given that I never asked for this effort and never expressed to them that it was something I ever wanted to exist or happen in the first place, that gives me an obligation. That's going to be our principal stance. But more importantly, we're going to give you a practical case that says that this will lead to a total loss of political will for state care, specifically of the elderly, why that's a massive problem, and why that perpetuates inequality. A little bit of reputation. So they go, they sacrifice, that creates a duty because it's sure. Can you explain why it is considered a job to care for someone else's child, but not to care for your own child? Why is it a job to care for someone else's? I mean, stay-at-home mothers often say that they are doing a job as well, so I don't know that it's so clear-cut. More importantly, just because it's a job to care for someone else's child, that's because like you want them to pay for that service. Ideally, we would have expanded daycare programs that don't require you personally to pay for that service. It's just the economy. like Things need to work in this way. Okay, so in terms of that, I'll get more on the obligation later, George. So in terms of the political will to care for the elderly, because I think the most important thing here is regardless of principled obligations, if everyone is having a better life, I don't know how you can stand on some kind of nebulous principle. Right here. Why do we get that? First off, a lot of people with money to care for the elderly would not be fans of paying for other people's elderly parents to live. George, I think, hits this on the POI as to why you have to pay for someone else to care for your child. Here's the thing, we still think there should be government tax and funded daycare programs because we recognize the inherent inequality of letting the individual 
deal with that, right? Here's the problem, though. Insofar as the people with the money to be able to provide these services don't want to give their money, they have an incentive to reduce taxes and to say, I don't want to spend money on things like old age homes, health care for old people, and things of that nature. More importantly, this is explicitly, as we hear from opening government, replacing things like retire government fund retirement programs and stuff like that, right? You are literally changing the role of welfare from the state for old people to individuals who care for their parents. Moreover, this literally criminalizes individuals who don't do this, right? So the rhetoric in the political sphere changes from, I don't think you have a right to take my money and spend on someone else, a very hard position to justify in the welfare state as it exists, to literally our state has said, if you do not care for your parent, you are a criminal. Why should we be helping out criminals to achieve something that they should just be doing as a basic human obligation? I think framing it as an issue of criminality makes it very hard for people to sympathize. Sure. Saying we support it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to throw everybody in jail. Let's talk about why that obligation is extinguished just because you didn't consent, the same way you don't consent to social contracts. Okay. I actually think, insofar as you don't consent to social contract, that's because there is literally like no way we can conceive of a functioning state if people don't live under some kind of laws. I gave you another better alternative to individual opportunity, right? The obligation, okay, I'm going to give the obligation in a second. I'll just flag it. This is going to be confusing if I have to jump back and forth. Finally, the other thing is a lot of old people are highly represented within the political sphere to the area a lot of other groups aren't. That means currently they're actually very good at winning the kinds of protections and expanding the kinds of systems we want to see on our side of the house. Few things. One, if you tell these people that the number one thing they should do is ask their kids for more money instead of trying to create some kind of social change, I think you lose out on their base. Insofar as they still want to create some kind of social change or still do lobby the government, I still think the rest of the electorate now largely resents old people for taking the money directly away from them by virtue of them having just been born in the first place. And I think they're more likely to say that's an illegitimate expense and outvote the already strong voting blocks when we don't see an expansion of these protections. Why is it unfair if we don't expand state protections of the elderly? First of all, incredibly unfair to the poor and needy. They say that we are not going to, for example, include people on minimum wage. There are a lot of people not on minimum wage who still have a hard time making ends meet. More importantly, they may have kids they want to send to college and things like that that are other large expenses that you can't always take into account. What this means is that the obligation placed on a poor person to care for their elderly person is, one, far more taxing on them than it is for a rich person. It's a much more meaningful, like difficult thing for them to accomplish, despite their already hard standing in life. Second, their parents get meaningfully worse care and stuff like that because they can't afford better care. I think the state would provide better alternatives through things like economies of scale, through things like taxing the rich and redistributing resources in a way that you as an individual cannot attain for your parent. Third, volatility. What if I, the son that is, has an obligation to my parent, gets really sick and dies, right? Like, I don't have the reserve of capital the state would have to be able to care for this person. Insofar as we take away from that reserve the obligation on me, more volatility. Fourth, autonomy. If I am the child, just like your parents told you what school you're going to, if I am the child and the state doesn't have a reasonable network of support, I just tell my old parent how they're going to live out the final years of their life. I think that can be very unpleasant for them. Finally, like, if I have a kid who wants to go to college, sure. What if this is contingent on our policy being mutually exclusive with current pension plans? Hey, here. Being mutually exclusive. Okay. One, they literally framed that as their OG case. They said this would be replace things like retirement pension savings. Second, it's about political will. It's that people aren't going to be willing to give general hubs of money to something they believe is a family obligation, right? Here, here. That is, the welfare state is opposed to family welfare. So, finally, when you have to pay for your kid to go to college and you can't do that, you increase inequality. On principled injustice, also the reputation for the thing about Uber, the loss of benefits shows why the state needs to step up and why we're likely to get that political change when people don't have benefits. Uh, forcing it onto the individual means they want an Uber driver to be forced to take care of their parents. What kind of care would you actually get in that situation? Principally, why you can't have a strong obligation based on sheer circumstance. One, you were never chose to be born, but now that you are born, you are biologically coerced into liking life. Pain hurts. You're not just going to kill yourself yourself because you don't like your parents, right? You have to live under your parents. So that means even if you didn't like the child that you had, maybe you weren't abused, maybe you were a gay child who was told your existence is wrong and you hate your parents for it, guess what? You're their slave and they can take your stuff and they have a claim to your stuff because apparently they loved you and gave you resources even though you don't feel that way. Finally, we hear a lot of people on their side of the house are going to want to do this anyway. So the people who don't are the ones who have an incentive to provide terrible care for their parents or something like bare minimum, right? They don't really love 
love them in the same way. Finally, if you could just resent your parents, right, for being wrong and exploited, your life is worse. Finally, as a, you are literally born as like a servitude spawn. You are born to your parents to have to take them into your house until you can't do that anymore. I don't think you should be chained to your parents for life. That's unjust. from opening opposition is the idea that you're, you don't ask to be born, therefore you shouldn't have any obligations attached to your birth. And the first uh, clash we'd like to uh, point out there is that when and after you're born, you don't ask to die either. So you don't actively deny or don't want the access to what your parents give you. The constant crying and the constant nagging that you want food, the constant nagging that you want to go to a better school or exist in an environment that better uh, allows you to grow as a human being means you don't, con you, you also, uh, like in comparison, you also don't uh, agree to being taken care of, but you are nonetheless. So now the question is, now that you're taken care of in both instances where you don't agree, do we still uh, implement policies where you don't agree but are still good for society and are still good for your existence in that society? And the answer is yes. Right? So the biggest point that we get from the side of the house, which they hinge a lot of their points on, is this idea of autonomy and what it does for a lot of old people and how society views them. The first idea they tell us is the idea of how old people are, are, are mostly represented, right? because of maybe regimes that have existed longer. We argue, uh, no, the people that you're talking about that are currently represented are old white people, in most instances, old white male. right? So groups like black families, Families or black old people are not in largely represented in that because they're not the constituency of the current government. So we think it's quite ignorant for you to identify one minority and say because they're represented, then everyone else in that in that class or in that group of people is represented. But secondly, we'd say in fact black old people, right, and female white people, most instances, are not represented in those uh, 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 in, in those financial frameworks. So in those welfare structures. That's why welfare is not a lot of money to begin with, right? And welfare doesn't even sustain a standard of living that is fair for everyone, right? So we argue, tell us, that, tell us why those people ought not to be represented, right? The second idea they tell us is that, uh, well, individuals ought to have the autonomy to buy into this, and we need to uh, 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 value their autonomy. One would tell you that we're talking about big states that usually use policy to nudge people in the right direction, right? So not everyone agrees to every policy that the American government or the British government has ever implemented, right? But the reason why that's justified and that's legitimate is because there's a social contract between the state and its people that will take away some of your rights and do certain things for you, like national security and other things, in order to make your life better. And in some instances, you might have to sacrifice your right to choose for another person's right to life and another person's basic rights. And we tell you that if we were to have a cost-benefit analysis between the right to choose and having the right to life for an old woman who lives in dire circumstances, it is uh, fair to assume that we take that option. Right? The second idea uh, he, he tells us is the, the reactions that we'll have towards all people will, will be more volatile. We'll, we argue there's a legal system that can protect these people. If, there's, if people being volatile gets too deep and it gets too real, we argue there are legal structures that actively protect people. Right. So we, we're not going to not just give gay people the right to marriage because people are going to hate them. We give them those rights and we try and change societal perception around doing certain things. That's why laws exist to change societal behavior and to nudge them in the right direction. So those are the three rebuttals. So I'm going to give you an idea of why children that were neglected and abused are an exception to this policy. And then you'll understand why this policy ought to stand morally and practically. 
So we need to understand that society exists with different individuals, right? And different individuals, meaning uh, we have different responsibilities. But the most important thing that you need to be aware of and to take as a premise is that we have contracts amongst each other as individuals, right? I have the contract right now to give a speech. You have the contract to mark that speech. They have the contract to respond to that speech, right? The same thing is happens with parenthood. It's a contract between the young and the old, and it's a contract between the more knowledgeable and the less knowledgeable, right? That's why when parents give birth to a child, they immediately according to the law adapt parental rights and responsibilities right so we're going to tell you here how when you're neglected or when you're abused those rights and responsibilities are then uh, 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 parents fail those rights and responsibility and that therefore that contract becomes null and void and why when you're not neglected or abused that part, that contract needs to stand right so the first idea here we tell you is that uh, when, when you're born, your parents have the responsibility, like my partner had said, to financially protect you, to physically protect you from torture and from abuse and so forth. But when they actively participate in inflicting these things on you, so when they're the ones neglecting you, when they're the ones punishing you, or when they're the, the ones maltreating you, it means they actively make that contract null and void because it is not in the contract for parents to harm their child. In fact, because the child is born they have the responsibility to protect that child. Yes. Contracts are the perfect example. Just because you do a duty for me, I cannot consign my right to exit a contract indefinitely going into the future. That's what you propose, right? Because you were a parent to me, I give up my autonomy. I have to just indefinitely give but you a stipend. The Where's the exit contract? Okay, so firstly, the assumption there is that you can't opt out of the contract, and that's a lie because there's something called emancipation, right? Where children can actively cut themselves off their parents. So you still have an option to opt out of that contract. In instances where you don't opt out of that contract, it means you're continuously agreeing to the conditions of that contract. And whether you like it or not, contracts oppose, uh, impose duties on you, and they impose responsibilities on you, right? And we argue in this case the responsibility is to be able to support your parents. So like I said, in instances where parents actively go against their responsibility, which the contract uh, uh, imposes on them, then they also uh, 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 they they forfeit the benefits of the contract. And the benefits of the contract in this instance would later on in, in their 60s or whatever would be getting financial support and financial protection from the child. So parents who have abused and neglected the child have not fulfilled their duties and terms according to the contract and thus lose the benefits of the contract or make the contract null and void. And we argue this is justified and this is evident because when parents give birth, they automatically through acts in America and in South Africa and other countries obtain parental rights and responsibilities. When they abuse you, they lose these rights, they lose these responsibilities. So we argue they're a proper exception. And your autonomy in big states is something that can be taken away from the social contract theory where practical goes. case stands on two pillars today. Firstly, we told you that it is principally unjustifiable to force people into bonded slavery when they have absolutely no choice in which to enter into that contract and have absolutely no exit clauses. We haven't heard sufficient refutation on that point, and that was the majority of the government case, and it's unfortunate that they didn't respond to any of my partners in the on that. But just as like a meta-debate point, kind of, usually when you're trying to like gov a case, you come up with like a problem in society that you try and fix with some policy and make the world better. We haven't really heard that from side proposition. From George's POIs, I assume he's going to say that old people are neglected in society and therefore this is going to be a better system that provides them better social services. That's why we preempt that really well in my partner's analysis where it gives you, I think, like six different reasons why like the elderly are going to be much worse off under this problem and creates a ton of perverse incentive structure which is going to mean that old people necessarily will live way worse lives when this policy is implemented. And I'll go through each of those two themes in turn. So firstly, 
on this idea of principles, right? So I think the principle that Sai proposition brings up is this idea that insofar as you expended some sort of effort, some sort of money into creating the life I'm living currently, I then owe you some sort of recompense because you expended that effort and there's some sort of relationships relationship there, not this time. A few problems with this, right? The analogy they draw, draw and like their entire case depends on the analogy towards parenthood, right? When you have a child, you have some sort of responsibility of that. But I think this is an entirely non-analogous point and my partner preempt this really well. Firstly, Parenting is a largely a choice in the vast majority of cases, and I think the state should work towards making this as much of a choice as possible. Sure. So I think we should heavily fund, for example, sex education, think, uh, legalize abortion and make adoption available to everyone at any age, for example. So even if you are for forced into having a child because of whatever circumstance you have, it is still always a continuing choice that you can opt out of if you feel this isn't a, this isn't a situation uh, that is working out for you, right? This doesn't exist on their side when I am then born, then, then uh, become 18 and I then and owe some sort of responsibility, right? Just because my parents spent some money on me and chose to keep me as a child, I have no way of actually consenting to that relationship or consenting to however much money I'm actually going to spend on them. I also have no out of this contract, right? Like if my parents like didn't treat me well or like I wasn't like even if I wasn't abused, quote unquote, which is their mechanism, I could still be emotionally abused, which goes entirely unre unresponded to. I could be not necessarily well loved or cared for and have like a bad experience as a child. I could be gay, for example, have parents who hate me but don't necessarily abuse me under the legal definition, right? So I might, might not necessarily want to give my parents a ton of money and want a con contractual out in a lot of cases, right? And they don't present that. So insofar as they want to make a principled claim, no thank you, on their side that you can universalize this principle and that all children somehow owe, uh, owe onto that, uh, owe onto their parents something, I don't think you give that, right? So what they're actually doing on their side and what they actually do have to defend and the burden they have to defend is a massive infringement on the rights of individuals, right? Insofar as my freedom is massively being infringed because I'm literally living in bonded servitude to my parents, that I'm not able to make financial choices in the future that best benefit me, I have to sacrifice getting further education, buying a house, having a family, for example, because I need to pay for my parents. This is a massive burden on me that they needed to justify with some sort of massive benefit that justifies that kind of huge rights uh, violation, right? They haven't done that on their side of the house. That's why they've lost this debate so far. I'll take back up. I'll take it as a All of your benefits rely on taxation, that is to say, bonded slavery to the state. Why is that legitimate, whereas bonded slavery to your parents is not? Great. On that point, uh, that moves me directly into my second theme of why the state is a better provider of social services than individuals, right? Because note in my first argument, I'm not claiming that it's impossible to infringe on rights in all cases. I'm just saying there's a massive burden on their side to justify the huge infringement of individual economic freedoms uh, and like this bonded slavery. I think we can way better justify that on our side of the house when taxation is much more marginal and we get much better benefits. That's the case we're resting on. No, thank you. We have, I think like, five or six different reasons as to why the state is necessarily better. Firstly, and that is just, this is like an incredibly regressive way to take money out of people. Insofar as they exclude the like incredibly poor, for example, even if you're middle class, for example, like. Think about like just the time in which you're going to do this. Most people retire when they're like 60, 65, and have kids around when they're 30. So when you are 30, you're both creating a family and also paying for your parents' retirements on their side of the house, right? This is a massive economic strain, particularly on those who are lower middle class who still fall under their system. No, thank you, right? So this is massive, massive amounts of money that we're taking from people who don't necessarily afford it, right? It would be better on our side of the house and more principally justified and more like just more successful if we just tax people who have the ability to pay for this more for example, the incredibly wealthy, and then redistribute that income in a way that makes sense. The status quo, which I think is working fairly fine. Also, this is just really harmful for those people who are in their mid-30s, right? Like, what kind of things are you doing when you're in your 30s? You're buying houses, you're, maybe you're starting your own business, you're getting a ton of education. You're forcing people to make these massive sacrifices in their lives just because they are slightly poor, right? I think this is a huge detriment on their individual lives, which hasn't particularly been justified. I'll take front half. Recognize that it's not true that there is no out, because the reality is most people retire at 65 and you realistically will probably have to support your parents for 10 years, because most people die at 75 or less. I mean, there's no out during the 10 years, that's the whole yeah. point, right? Just because people die doesn't mean you aren't paying money at some point, right? Second reason why the state is better, you just get worse care on their side of the house because it's individuals paying into it. It creates, like, you don't get the benefits of economies of scale that we talk about, but also, if I'm an individual paying for this, I have the incentive to give the worst possible care because I'm the one paying for it. I want to pay the least amount of money. Insofar as my partner tells you why the, uh, the elderly are the ones who have the most political power, they are the best able to advocate for themselves. This responds to what I assume is going to be their extension, that rich people are neglected by the state. Insofar as, sure, in America, like, social services aren't particularly great, but 
across the world, like rich people get by far the most protection from the state. No, thank you. Right? Like in Greece, for example, during the economic crisis, when they try to slightly increase the like uh, the age of retirement, people were rioting on the streets. Right? These are the most politically mobilized group, and they're the ones most able to ask the state for benefits. I think they've been able to successfully do that. Right? That's why in the United States, no one's going to touch Social Security, even the Republicans, because rich people always advocate for themselves and are fairly good at it. Really importantly, third reason we give you, volatility is huge, right? Like when you're a kid, there's no huge volatility in the expenses you have. Kids don't get like sick very often, but rich people get massively sick, right? They have sometimes get cancer and you'll have to pay $800,000. That will literally destroy you financially if you're middle class. You destroy your entire life and any, any plans you have in the future. There's huge volatility. What we say is a better plan is when you aggregate all these expenses to the state. So when there's a huge increase in cost for one, for one family, the state can better absorb that and you're not fucked over because your parents got cancer and you had nothing like you had nothing to do with that and you want to care for your parents but you just can't right I think that's particularly bad we also tell you very importantly why there's a state incentive to actually reduce care there's a replacement effect and this deals with the mutual exclusive exclusivity PLI. Right? insofar as for them to have any kind of efficacy on their side we need to replace some social services with some sort of money you're getting from your parents right it can't just be like extra taxes going to people we can just increase taxes I think in this case we've proven principally and practically why this is a better system proud to work with. The elderly routinely scavenge trash cans in search of cardboard boxes that they can then sell out for measly amounts of money, all in the hopes of feeding themselves. They sometimes go to hawker centers, pick out the morsels of food left in order to ensure their own basic survival. So I'm really unclear when Owo tells us that the elderly are politically powerful and can therefore ensure that necessary protections are adequate in the status quo. I'm not quite sure where exactly he's talking about. Let's just make one thing clear first. Let's be clear that Singapore runs this exact model, it's called the Maintenance Act that was introduced sometime in the 2000s alongside state pensions. None of the state support networks they talk about are in any way mutually exclusive to what we suggest. What exactly do we bring to you from closing government? Three arguments. First, why it's moral principally. Second, how this ensures the elderly are better taken care of. Last of all, how this disproportionately helps women. Uh, how, how this helps women massively. Rebuttal will be integrated. First point, therefore, why is it moral? Let's just point out that the bulk of OO's principal uh, analysis was entirely contingent on the idea that parents choose to have children, whereas children don't choose to take care of their parents, right? This, is, this underlies the arguments that one, parenting is a choice, two, that children never ask to be born, and three, this places some kind of toll on the middle class. The first point we'd like to make under this is that most parents don't, in fact, choose to take care of their own children. Why is this the case? First, in many states, abortion is just outright illegal. We think it's therefore just false and dishonest to assert that parents meaningfully made a choice to have their children. But even if abortion was not outright bad, in Texas for instance, where there's a real possibility that you might have 10, only 10 clinics to service the entirety of the state's 40,000 women, we think in effect, women have no real choice but to have the children being born. In that circumstance, those parents don't choose to have their children. No, thank you. But second, even if this is not the case, there's often massive cultural pressure, especially in more conservative societies, upon women to never ever have an abortion. So in all these instances, there's no meaningful choice. Even not talking about abortion. For instance, in many states where contraception is just exorbitant and prohibitively expensive and not really available. In these circumstances, again, parents don't choose consciously to have their children. Nonetheless, parents are not exempt from these duties no matter what kind of existential or extenuating circumstances are incumbent upon them. What exactly is the impact of this? This means that, one, we can impose moral duty where there is some kind of utility to be gained, but more than that, we can impose moral duties by virtue of moral reciprocity, which moves me on to the second point, uh, second point under this argument, therefore, about moral reciprocity. OG told us that parents take care of children by paying for their football classes, etc, etc, which might or might not be variable in, circumstance, in certain circumstances. What we bring to you from CG is that, number one, 
the bulk of your neural connections are formed as a kid when you're about one to two years old. And these are the neural connections that determine who you are as a child, who you eventually grew up to be, your likelihood chances of success, whether economically, career-wise, etc, etc. More than that, parents are also directly responsible for the kinds of genetics that are passed on. All of which means that in every circumstance, regardless of whether or not parents pay for extensive classes for you to take, nonetheless, these are uh, labor, these are forms of contributions by parents which must be rewarded. O tells us that, well, children might be emotionally abused. This was pointed out that one in many state legislatures, emotional abuse still constitutes abuse yeah, yeah. and can be encompassed directly. But more than that, if a child is if a child emotionally abuses a parent, we don't extend that parent from paying and taking care of that child. We don't see why the reversal necessarily has to be true. The upshot of this is that even if we accept O's claim to do it, that it'll be financially hefty and expensive for the middle class, we think nonetheless it's too bad. We don't think your ability to buy a child or to buy a house or to pay for your child's college education is more important than ensuring that your parent doesn't leave, uh, live on morsels of food. Last point I did this to thank you is that freedom of autonomy is irrelevant. O told us that we will pay for state services. Yeah, sure, but all of this is contingent on taxation, which is coercion by the state. So somehow when it's coercion by the state, it's legitimate, but when it's coercion by your own child, it's not. DRO tells us that it's because the state has better providers of care and service. First, we're going to dispute that. But second, even if this is the case, we argue that this is a principal claim which is independent of any standard of care that will be provided. Second argument, therefore, how the elderly will be better taken care of. Here, I'm going to contrast state support versus the child directly taking care of his or her parent. Thank you. Three arguments. First, state support often lacks accountability. When you chuck like huge numbers of the elderly into elderly homes, what you often get is the elderly without the agency to protest when conditions are dismal, coupled with no third party with any sufficient interest to ensure that any kinds of appalling conditions within caregiving homes materialize. What does that mean is that elderly homes which are currently already massively understaffed and caregivers massively overworked are only going to be even worse on opposition side. Whereas on our side, where the individual child has a far greater incentive to take care of his or her parents, but more than that, has some sort of accountability mechanism because not a parent can directly take his or her child to court, we ensure that such conditions don't happen. Closer. Is the intention of this policy to create a standard in society where everyone is responsible to care for their parents when they get old? Yeah, sure. Right. Second argument, therefore, pensions are most easily cut. So when all tells us about volatility in scale side, which is really most volatile, why is this the case? Because pensions are most easily cut given that one, they result in the least political outcry. The elderly tend to be quite politically disenfranchised and don't have the mechanisms of making lots of political noise. Second, there's no visible immediate benefit to providing pensions. That means that when they're cut, there's no immediate visible cost, so people are broadly fine with it. What is the impact of this? This means that it's not so much about the absolute amount of money or pensions provided to the individual elderly, but rather the elderly's, uh, uh, the elderly having stability, financial stability as well as financial certainty, right? Because one, any kind of financial uncertainty exacts a psychological toll. But more than that, it's precisely the elderly who can't recover easily from sudden financial shocks or sudden debilitating illness, etc. etc. So because stability financially is so important, it's their side which ensures financial volatility. O tells us that this results in the loss of political capital. And our response is, so what? We're not quite sure why it's so bad having a bunch of angry people when the comparison is that now we ensure the elderly are taken care of. Last point, therefore, how does this proportionally hurt women? Let's be clear that women have been institutionally disenfranchised and coerced into child giving, but without receiving none of the due compensation. Why? Because why? It's a cultural expectation that women are the one who take and shoulder the bulk of child giving, uh, uh, the, the bulk of caregiving duties. But second, they often face barriers to entering the workforce, and nonetheless have no choice but to stay at home and take care of the elderly. As a result, last of all, because it's often not an electoral issue that decides who wins an election, most people don't care about who exactly about paying women to take care of the elderly. We think nonetheless the fact that we, are, we find it okay and conscionable to pay someone else to look after the elderly, but not to pay to ensure that a parent is paid for looking care of their own child, is something that we can't stand for. Nonetheless, this is labour that is duly carried out and this labour that needs to be duly rewarded. As a result, we think that because this, this, this will massively help women to ensure that they gain the kinds of financial leverage and financial compensation that they deserve is justified. All in all, first of all, because it's moral, second, because it ensures the elderly are better taken care of, and last of all, because it massively uplifts women incredibly proud of standing up. Woo! Thank you.
Mr. Speaker, I think even in the best case of what government is bringing to us, the ideological responsibility that a child has to their parent falls short when you look at the tangible outcomes of forcing children to care for their parents. As much as they want to claim that this is not a band-aid, that this is not a substitute for state infrastructure to care for them, when you have a state advocating for a familial structure to be the way by which a person is given resources at the end of their life, it comes at the exchange of state resources that do the same. Um, that, that is not the crux of my rebuttal, but it's something that necessarily needs to be dealt with by side uh, government. So I'm going to talk to you about two things. Firstly, how this entrenches and makes cyclical the income levels of the lower and middle classes. And secondly, how this worsens the familiar rela relationships that Gov is trying to strengthen. First, some rebuttal. So starting with the most absurd thing, which was the least constructed from the closing. The idea that women right now receive little to no compensation and are treated poorly by state and social mechanisms tells us very little as to why we should then force them to buy back into paternalistic familial structures wherein they get even less representation and less care and less access to resources. Families and familial structures that are traditionally paternalistic and situated on the male members of those families is a particularly terrible instance, or a particularly terrible mechanism to then redistribute to them. We think also redistributing to them at the end of their life when they're 75 is a, perhaps again, a band-aid measure that state might say this is redistributive, but in fact not actually accessing the root of the problem that they want to solve for. When they're already consigned to life of, uh, as an elderly caretaker in a family isn't when we most want to help them. CG also says that the systems that care for the elderly now are uniquely bad. They give no analysis, and please look at your notes, no analysis as to why familial structures are better for caring for the elderly than their government alternatives. We think that families are uniquely bad at doing so, especially the types of families that are either going to put them into the very same nursing homes that they would be going to otherwise if they are the upper class, or those middle and lower, lower middle classes, if those are the ones we're dealing with, that are now taking on the burden of these families and don't have the resources to provision to them in the same way that government does. CT also tells you that the bulk of, of your neural connections occur when you're at ages one through three and parents are your genetics, right? We think that this is uh, a, 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 they're trying to swing at the case that opening government tried to bring you, that parents give good things to their children, but opening government couldn't tell you any good things that parents necessarily give to their children, and therefore had to fall back on genetics. We don't think that this is a reasonable expectation for children to be consigned to this life, to, to hurting their own life and their own livelihood for the purposes of caring for these individuals, and I'll give you more justification as to why that is. So OG also says in response to Daniel's PUI that they're, they're okay with greater social safety nets and the state um, take care of the elderly, but in instances when they're absent, we have a choice between government structures and familial laws, they choose the latter. This choice accepts all of the harms of OO and the harms I'm going to bring you on CEO, and we think that this choice necessarily is mutually exclusive to one another to a degree. OG also says that there's a problem that people are working for Uber and don't pay into 401ks. This seems like precisely the kind of thing that a state mechanism would be best at solving, not a family structure. No analysis as to why it's better in families. OG says that there's emancipation, and therefore people can free themselves from conflicting fam familial structures. So either, Mr. Speaker, everyone that doesn't want to pay for their parents will opt out through emancipation, like they do now, and the nice people that are are already going to pay for the parents, will continue to pay for the parents, or that doesn't have actually a mechanism to help people that are stuck, stuck, stuck in difficult familial situations. So first, uh, how this entrenches and makes cyclical, um, uh, 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 makes cyclical the income levels of lower middle classes. So building on the analysis from our opening that says that government structures are better at provisioning for people, we think that people are better at provisioning for themselves. We think that individuals caring for themselves and investing in their own future is a mechanism by which we, we, we trust people to, to, to proceed in, in, in the status quo, right? They've had 70 years to affect the political process of their state, 70 years to save for the future, to prepare for the eventual, eventuality that they will one day not be able to keep working. It's unclear why if they do so poorly, 20 or 30 year old kids of these parents should bear the brunt of their poor saving only on the merit that their parents have saved poorly. Go ahead. In most instances, parents who have multiple children don't ever have a time to accrue benefit for themselves because they are continuously sending their children to universities such as this. Exactly. And, and so those instances, those families, it's especially important not to undercut the upper mobility of those children by forcing them to care for their parents. And this is what I'll bring you especially. So in fact, the fact that your parents have saved and prepared poorly is expressly why you should be freed from bearing the cost of their care. Why is this? 
Firstly, that poor saving usually comes from poor education services that the state didn't prepare for you. Secondly, if they are poor and have no capacity to save, and they have to just spend all of their income as they get it, then it's the fault of the state that didn't provision opportunities and welfare for you to get that long-term saving as an option. We think that the state then turning around and saying, and now it is your job to care for your parents, further entrenches those cycles in the middle class in the cases that they're willing to deal with. But why is this still going to affect the lower classes, even if it's not mandated in law? Taylor asked this as a POI to the closing, but it was also a product in the substantive from the opening. I'll take you in 30 seconds. Um, we think that, that, um, uh, that when this standard extends to those in poverty, is what, insofar as government endeavors to have these laws affect themselves into social practice and be standardized, those standards trickle down whether government wants them to or not. Making a law as government is sticking a value of how things ought to be. So the poorest families face stigmatization and are heavily influenced into taking on this burden when it's socialized that you must take care of your parents. Um, I'll take closing, go ahead. You tell us that if a parent takes care of four children and ultimately requires financial support at old age, that parent has prepared poorly and it's his or her own fault. Why is it not the child's fault for having prepared poorly by not budgeting for having to provide for because the parent children and his or have 20 or 25 years to prepare and parents have 70. Okay, so the poorest families face stigmatization or heavily influenced to pay for this. We see this as a problem now in Jordan and Lebanon and Japan where the poorest families may have more dependence because government societies, you are scum if you don't care for your parents and they're forced into doing so. We think the socialization is bad for everyone. So how does this worsen familiar relationships that government is trying to strengthen? First, estrangement that falls short of abuse is not mandated, is not, is not affected on their side, right? We see insofar as government agrees that victims of, of abuse ought to be exempted, there are levels of abuse that cannot be put into writing that can't be that, that you shouldn't still be forced to pay into, right? I think this is covered by our opening. More importantly, instances of abuse are now required to be reported in order for free individuals to free individuals from their dependents. So victims of abuse at age 40, when their parents are now calling on them, have to dredge up events from 25 years ago and, and give them in court documents to the state. We think that is necessarily harmful to those individuals and is bad for them in a way that other structures don't require them to do. But third, instances outside of abuse, familiar obligations are now government mandated and contrived. If you want social benefits from the family structure, you don't get any when the state is mandating that newly economically dependent youth are trying to, or independent youth are told, you must put your family, your life, your education on hold in order to care for your parents because the government will not do so. We think these systems are uniquely terrible for correcting for the harms that they're trying to on side government. We're very proud to oppose. I realized very on in this debate that it was going to irritate me. And the point at which I irritated, uh, I realized I was going to be irritated, was when the leader of the opposition said, we cannot regard any principle that leads to an overall worse off world. Only in British parliamentary debating, ladies and gentlemen, would that be a logically coherent sentiment. Because the idea that it's fine to do evil things, as long as it makes some people better off, is accepted in literally no other sphere of existence. What Etz brought you specifically in extension is that children have an overwhelming duty to their parents, and that, crucially, all good things which a child has produced in their life can effectively be traced back to the parents. The parents deserve a share of that, and to deny it to them would be prima facie evil. I'm going to talk about three things. Firstly, why parents deserve this. Secondly, why kids specifically should be made to pay. And thirdly, some chat about the state. So, why do parents deserve this money? Opening opposition ask for a problem in this debate. Here it is. The problem is that most people in the world have kids who they never consented to have. They were, in effect, 
coerced into having those children. X gives you three reasons in rebuttal to suggest that is the case. Firstly, she tells you that the vast majority of people exist without contraception, whether that's through educational failings or technological failings, or simply through the stigma that attaches in very religious societies. Secondly, she explained why most people have limited access to abortion, because throughout, uh, throughout very religious countries, and especially in the developing world, that is simply illegal or restricted to the point of being in practice illegal. And thirdly, I think it's pretty fair to say that the vast majority of individuals within the world have no good access to adoption services because of the immense uh, stigma that attaches to giving up a child. And also just most state adoption Sorry. services are pretty facing terrible. So not only is the having of a child an enormously invasive thing which is forced upon you, it is also, in, and not only as well, is it incredibly gendered, effectively discriminating against 51% of the world's population, but perhaps worst of all, it in effect constitutes a full-time job. This arbitrary burden which has been forced on you, um, which produces a huge amount of productivity in the form of everything your child will ever achieve, this is in effect labour which parents have no choice but to give up and which is never rewarded. If your child becomes a CEO, I think X gave you several good reasons to suggest that is basically entirely your own achievement and your own work. However, you will never be rewarded for any of that productivity in spite of the fact that it was your job and your labour which was coerced from you for a period of up to 18 years. We point this out in a POI to opening opposition. We tell them that parenting is in effect a job, and if you want a, a thought experiment as to why that's true, then why do you think we pay individuals to look after other people's children, but not to look after their own children. Daniel's only response to this was I I interesting. He said, but many parents see what they're doing as a full-time job. Yes, on closing government we say they are right to see it as a full-time job, because it is a full-time job for which they deserve recompense. So, at the end of this argument, what should you take away? That the premise of this debate is in effect, or should be, that there is a huge amount of unrewarded and effectively coerced labour going on in the world in the form of parents being coerced into raising their children. That is an injustice which should prima facie be redressed. I don't think opposition has given you any reason in this debate to suggest that that injustice gets better on their side of the house. I'll, I was, uh, unless opposition whip wants to offer you one, I think the basic premise of this debate is the only proposition can correct for that fundamental injustice. Let's move on from talking about parents then to talking about children. No thanks. Look, what X tells you in extension is that any benefit and any productivity accrued by the child over the course of their lifetime is effectively down to parents. I think opening government are perfectly correct in pointing out that many parents make sacrifices to advance the welfare of their children. But what X crucially adds to this is that, in effect, all things a child has ever done, or will ever produce, is largely contingent on things that were done to it by parents at a very early age. Whether or not that is the genetic abilities that are passed on from a parent to a child, whether it's the values that are installed at a very early age, or, and what's perhaps most crucially, the, crucial, the environment in which they were raised, say, in the first two years of their life. That is when people develop their basic concepts of empathy. That is when they develop their basic concepts of self-discipline. And all of that is contingent on the neuro connections that are formed as a result of the environment that their parents specifically constructed for them. At that point, I think it is reasonably fair to say that everything that children do within their lives is to some extent the parent's achievement as much as it is theirs. In those circumstances, the uh, children who do not pass on some of that benefit to their parents are committing an injustice. What is the response we get to this from the opposition? The first thing opening opposition tells us is that this is very like sex. No, I, I don't think that's true, for the relatively simple reason that someone wandering around for 18 years after me trying to seduce me provides me with no benefits. In fact, it's probably really annoying. No offence, Daniel. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, they said children have never consented into this. The whole point of Atsuko's speech was to tell you that parents haven't consented into it either. And in that circumstance, where neither party has really consented, what are we to do then? Fortunately, we have an excellent analogy for what we do when neither party and a contract has consented into it. It's called the state, it's called the social contract. We probably like bind both of those parties to the contract anyway because it's basically the only thing we can do. Then they say perhaps the parents are emotionally abusive. That is at best an argument for a wider definition of what constitutes abuse. I think everyone in this debate can agree that emotional abuse counts as abuse. I will take opening. Sir, in countries like Malaysia that you're talking about, elderly suffer because of income inequality, not irresponsible kids. The only mechanism you have is having the destitute right. care for the destitute Excellent. and removing, most importantly, the state's uh, responsibility well, this over is the just elderly. Basically, we use taxation to, to my third point, which is because of the state. 
I don't think anyone on Proposition Bench has ever said that we are solely relying on this policy to keep yeah. the elderly from destitution. I certainly don't think that was in the government mechanism. We all think on Proposition Bench that these two policies should run concurrently. That in effect, parents deserve a share of their child's income, uh, but that's not necessarily what we rely on to keep them in subsistence levels. Opening opposition say this is necessarily mutually exclusive with state pension funds. I would point out that on a strictly logical level, necessity is disproved by the existence of counterexamples. The existence of Singapore invalidates the case of the opening opposition. But the only real analysis they gave you for that is, is that the old are quote unquote incredibly politically powerful. I think Etz has a very decent response to this when she says, look, pension funds are literally the easiest thing for a government to raise in the world. It's easy to renege on obligations which were made by your predecessor government 30 years ago. It's easy to cut back on a state pension fund, hence why social security, in spite of what everyone on opposition is trying to tell you, is going bankrupt under the status quo, because governments have been raiding it consistently for the past hundred years. Look, this was never a debate about state services. We think it's perfectly fine to support multiple things within a proposition, and that is the thing we are proud to do in this debate. they raised me in some way doesn't oblige me to pay for their medical expenses, to pay for their housing indefinitely as they age. In fact, imposing that burden on children means that you're going to get necessarily worse family structures, you're going to get worse political advocacy and monetary and financial support for the elderly. And ultimately, that the economic impacts on all classes of society are so harsh that this policy will do no benefits to either the young or the old members of society, and in fact, harm the relationship between the two. Okay, I have a couple points of rebuttal before I get into two questions to summarize this debate, which is one, how does this impact the relationship between children and parents, and why is that relationship necessarily worse moving forward with this policy? And two, the economics, the economics of this policy, which apparently is particularly important, to both sides, but I think it is true because the economics of the situation mean that neither party is in fact better off when we move forward with this policy. But first, a few points of rebuttal, particularly to closing government. So first is the idea that people were coerced into having children in many states across the world. Okay, so the state should be the ones who correct for this. If you have established a system in your state in which you deny people access to abortions, you deny people birth control, and you deny women the right to advocate for their own bodily autonomy, then it is your burden as a state to fix for that Period. when those people are forced to have children they don't want, and, then are, and now you're going to later force them to care there was children to care for their parents who didn't want them in the first place. I think that when kids who were not wanted by their parents are then forced to care for those parents, you actually increase a tenuous relationship that probably already exists, and the tension is in fact far worse moving forward between those people. But also this idea that everything a child has done in its life is largely due to the relationship between children and parents, and that the, the one to two years after I was born are the reasons why I am the way I am today, this is not, in fact not true. This is the reason we don't jail all parents whose kids become criminals, right? Because there are largely circumstances in your life that you had choice in determining, and that is the reason why you are where you are. We don't blame parents for every single bad thing their kids do, and in that same vein, we don't hold kids responsible when their parents are unable to care for themselves they're ugly. In fact, it is likely the reason, this is what Janie tells you, the reason that those elderly people have been unable to save properly in their pension fund is not because they had a lot of kids that they didn't want, but in fact because the government and the state was unable to provide them with mechanisms yeah, yeah. to care for themselves and to save properly, right? They were unable to provide them with a reasonable wage when they were working in society. They were unable to provide them with social security measures. That means as they age, there would actually be a nest egg for them to retire to. 
And because the state was the one who failed on its responsibility to protect all of its citizens, who failed on its responsibility to the social contract that government cares so much about, it is the state's duty now to care for those people. Mm -hmm. Open it. What about the parental contract that you have with the child to bear for them? And in most instances, the reason why families or parents that can't take care of themselves now are at the so, stage okay. because they couldn't. <coughs> I understand what you're saying, right? There is a relationship between children and parents. But it isn't this strict contract that the government has defined, right? right? There's a reason we allow people to give up their children to systems of adoption if they believe that they cannot take care of their children. In fact, there is a reason that the state comes into households who are not properly taking care of their children and removes them. Because the state is the one who has the responsibility to care for all of its people. We do not impose that burden solely on parents. And when, and when we also, in government, you have very little mechanism for children who feel as if they cannot take care of their parents to get out of that contract, we see that you've actually undermined the case of a contracts on government. Okay, but one, how does this impact their relationship between children and their parents? One, we think that it undermines this empathetic character that government wants to say you get from this relationship between mm -hmm. children and parents when it creates a government-mandated relationship that says this is how you must engage, right? You want empathy and genuine relationships. You don't impose attention and you don't force a burden on children as they age to take care of their parents when they don't want to do so. But in fact, we think it means that in order to get out of these responsibilities, children have to prove abuse, right? That means exactly what Danny told you, that if I was abused as a child, and I chose to move out of my house when I turned 16 and get a job and live on my own, and I estranged myself from my parents, I did that because I didn't want to relive those memories of abuse. But when, in order to get out of paying for my parents' like retirement, I have to relive those experiences of abuse in court to prove that in fact I shouldn't have to care for my parents because they did violate the social contract the government cares so much about. We think this is bad. We think this incurs an Im immense emotional harm on children. I'll take closing. You've told us that the state is the one who should be responsible, not children. Given that the state pays with taxes collected from these very children, the only difference is whether the money goes through the intermediary of state facilities or whether it's paid directly to parents. Okay, we think there's a large redistributive effect of taxes, right? So we think that on government side of the house, and this I'll you know, we'll just get to my second point, right? What are the economic impacts of this policy, right? We think that this entrenches a social standard, as government conceded, that everyone should care for their parents, right? So even if you're not middle class, even if you're poor, you're a bad person if you can't take care of your parents, if you don't let them live at home for you, because you said you wanted to have a social standard in which everyone cares for their parents because they raised you, they gave you your DNA, we care the most about them. But what this means, is that individual families, Question. particularly patriarchal structures of families in which men are in control, individual families who are unable to care for their parents are going to have an increased burden. When you have a taxation Question. policy that allows everyone who is old, because they have paid into society for a long time and, and built the society to what it is in that moment, we think that when those people have a mechanism within that state that they have created to then care for them, because they largely, as a group, create a society, the society that exists now, so largely as a group, with a redistributive effect of less burden on poor people who are unable to actually pay for the individual elderly person they might have responsibility for, but in fact, the society in general would be able to better care for these individual people because they have the resources to, redis to redistribute the resources from the wealthy class to the poor class so that all poor people, all poor elderly people, can in fact be taken care of. Whereas on your side of the house, the best care exists only for the wealthy white male old people because they're the ones whose families likely have the resources to take care of them. And in fact, you do no benefit to the poor minority elderly people whose families are likely unable to pay for them in the first place, but you still impose a burden on those families where they feel as if they must take care of these people or they are bad members of society. We think that what this means is that kids and parents have a more tense relationship and the only way to get out of this obligation, which they likely will never be able to fulfill, is to, re to redredge up instances of abuse or fabricate those instances of abuse so that they exist because you want to get out of this contract. I think this is bad for both relationships and the economics of any country. Thank you.